Bitcoin is getting a lot of mainstream attention. It's in the news a lot lately, but more importantly, it's getting its share of disinformation too. Whether you have it now or you decide that you're going to use it later, I want you to understand that the media, YouTube, ERS, radio, newspapers, and television are all trying to confuse you on purpose. Welcome to the Insecurity Brief. This is the Insecurity Brief podcast. It features tech news and analysis throughout the world. This podcast is made possible through advertising and listeners like you. We need your help. Please subscribe. We know you are out there. If you can't donate, please share this program. We We depend depend on on you. you. First, a couple things going on in the news. Hungarian official confirms that the government bought and used Pegasus spyware. I've talked quite a bit about Pegasus and the NSO group and these other spyware groups uh, that get confused with marketing efforts. These are all the same deal. So when somebody takes information like off your credit card, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but grabs any of your data and uses it in any way, this is all feeding into the same pot. These are not individual things and, oh, it's just for marketing. It's not just for marketing. It's for manipulation and using your information against you. There was another piece of um, disinformation that I saw posted in one of the major newspapers. I'm not going to quote them on purpose or mention them because it was garbage. What it said is that the NSL group didn't um, go after any one plus numbers. One plus is the uh, escape code in the phone system for the United States. So what they were trying to say is this opinion piece that got put into a mainstream newspaper was that information, the Pegasus software wasn't deployed by NSO group to spy on American citizens, which is complete garbage. Okay, not just that group, but others both tracked both um, the people that were involved in protesting in the United States, a number of them that Uh, burnt buildings and things in LA, in Seattle, in New York. Individuals that were involved in these activities have been arrested and convicted by the federal government. And it wasn't just from camera data, um, like they want to tell you. There were other pieces of information coming up from January 6th, where people were also picked up um, and Um, that were on the complete opposite side of the political spectrum and also their their information is being used um, and gathered up. So this stuff about the illegal tapping of our phones needs to stop. There is already a law that the federal government could use Um, which is a really old one that says that you're not allowed to tap telephone calls. And since cell phones are telephones in its sense, come on, guys, do your job. Uh, Of course, they're not going to. Um, This other story came out of, and what I wanted to focus on today, which is Bitcoin. There was a article that got released, and this is a deal on Bitcoin. Okay, can Bitcoin be tracked? Yes, that's the idea of Bitcoin is to be tracked, but you can hide who the originator is. And I did a podcast with somebody that has a Bitcoin wallet, and we talked about that information, and I would really... Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll put a link to that podcast 
which was uh, done on another podcast effort. I'll put a link in the show notes to that because it's really kind of relevant and help you understand some of the things that are going on today. Now, Secure SE, uh, which is that Greek website I like so much, published a story, I think it was today, um, U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, is issuing a warning about the growing use of a number of cryptocurrency scams appearing in the U.S. The FBI, and reading on in their story really quickly, I'm not going to read the entire thing. I'll put, again, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. The FBI recently announced that fraudsters are forcing citizens to use physical cryptocurrency ATMs and digital QR codes to complete malicious transactions. The scammers often demand payment and the victim also may uh, withdraw money from his account. Scammers provide a QR code associated with their cryptocurrency unit wallet to use by the victim in the transactions the FBI explained in its warning. The scammer then directs the victim to a physical cryptocurrency ATM to enter their money, buy cryptocurrencies, and use the provided QR code to automatically fill in the recipient's address. Okay, with that being said, what this warning was about was a warning about the Black Matter group, which I talked about before, and Black Matter Ransomware as a service had launched in July with its goal of uh, corporate breach networks owned by companies in the U.S., Canada, and Australia, and the U.K., and has had at least $100 million in revenue so far. The group itself said that it does not attack hospitals, critical infrastructure, nonprofit organizations, defense industries, and government organizations. Uh, Black Matter is responsible for encrypting systems of organizations in the U.S. and uh, for ransom up to uh, $15 million in regular currency. So what's going on is this is sort of a side rail, but it's kind of the same thing. What's going on is that Bitcoin is being put front and center. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but Walmart has adopted uh, getting Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin ATMs. And also uh, Bitcoin ATMs are being installed by uh, little companies. And again, this comes to regular bank security. So what I'm going to talk about for a little bit is a sidetrack. But I want you to understand where some of this stuff comes from and understand what the history of the banking industry, because the banking industry basically sucks, man. Uh, honestly, these guys are cold and want to take as much of your dollars, as much as your work, as they possibly can. Um, they do it in fees, and they do it in a whole bunch of other things. Of course, if you have lots of money, they want you to uh, keep your money in their system so that they make interest off of it. But, you know, this is the way to go round. A while back, I'm talking before the internet. Um, a long time ago, there was a push in the 1920s and 1930s, actually right after the Depression, to um, what was going on is people would work and their paycheck would get stolen, or their money, they would get paid in money, really, and they would get the money stolen from them. So what banks pressed into 
to people was, and employers was that they could write out a check and the check obviously was only good for the pay, payer. So people would, the bank would retain the funds and it was in a secure method. Well, what really happened was a bunch of banks at the time had hired a bunch of people to attack a bunch of construction workers and steal their pay so that it would make it in the news in both Chicago and in New York. If you try to find these stories, um, they've been scrubbed from the internet. I looked and I remember reading them when I was a kid because I had to do a school report on something about this and I found it way back when and I remembered it but you can't find it on the internet. So basically what happened was the banking industry used media to trick people into a false sense of security. They don't want you to keep the dollars yourself, they want you to keep it in the bank so that the bank doesn't give you any interest, but they retain money and on and on and on. And then, of course, the 1930s also, 1920s and 1930s also had a lot of robbery going on. That, uh, the robbery of the banking industry and the banking industry doing, sending its bounty hunters and private police after people that were stealing instituted the FBI and the federal government then made it uh, a policy making it illegal for banking to um, self-protect uh, themselves. They were dissuaded by the federal government, meaning that banking issues then first with the FBI, then with the Secret Service, with the Secret Service Act, um, making them in charge of financial transactions, turned all banking into tax dollar enforcement. So when the internet came along, the banking industry kind of relaxed itself in security. I mean, look at it this way. In 1960s, before the internet again, they were um, the credit industry was sending cards out to literally anybody that wanted them. I mean, if you think it's easy to get a credit card now, in the 1960s and 19, early 1970s, it was common for the mailing industry, who was trying to track everybody even back then, to send a credit card out to people's pets because they had the pet name. Um, it, not obviously, but Bob the dog would get a credit card, you know, Bob and whatever your last name is. Um, because they were recorded as living there. The marketing industry has been, after 9-11, really vicious in collecting information about us and has gotten much better. Plus, there was a, there was a whole bunch of regulation that happened in the 1970s because um, before 1973, there were a bunch of things. Women couldn't have bank accounts or were barred from the banking industry in a lot of cases. They were barred from the credit industry. And of course, anybody that wasn't white was barred from the credit industry as well. In the Credit Reform Acts of the 19, early 1970s really made it so that it was equal in the United States across the board. I don't really know what was going on in Europe. I just know a little bit about what's going on in the United States. The reason that, I want to, that I'm talking about these things is because of the tracking and the inability to track what is called Bitcoin. Now, if you're not familiar with cyber uh, currency and what is behind this movement at this time and this isn't the first time that things have been around there have been a couple Ponzi schemes that were around um, tech uh, tech currency and 
before Bitcoin that failed, that also put out information that was counter. Now, there's a difference between using a vehicle it for uh, actual day-to-day -day transactions and long-term investment. If we're talking about long-term investment, it's a separate conversation than your daily transactions. Hopefully, you have it, some sort of long-term investment plan and you have what is called day-to-day -day transactions and they're totally separate. You have a separate bank account for them. The day-to-day -day transactions that are in, offered in through the traditional banking system have some regulated protections in them. So when you write a check, if you're still using checks, uh, those are pretty much been um, converted all over to electronic payment, especially since the pandemic. I mean, there are there are some people that use checks, businesses use checks still in some situations. But what happens when you write a check and somebody in a consumer law versus uh, business law in the consumer law by the way I'm not an attorney I don't represent myself being an attorney so when I'm talking about these things I'm not offering legal or investment advice I hear people say this all the time I don't want really don't want to get sued over this either so when we were talking about day-to-day -day transactions and the consumer side, if somebody steals money from your bank account, either they steal it by stealing your credit card number or they steal it from um, writing you a check, these, the FBI and the Secret Service are left to follow up on that occurrence and hired, or actually, the reason is that there is a insurance scam. <laughs> scam. They're not a scam. Well, they sort of are. It's called FDIC. And FDIC was a separate corporation that was set up by government regulation to protect the bank accounts and to put stability into the banking system. I live in Connecticut and we had the first SNL scandal, meaning that a bunch of builders built this bank. They borrowed, over borrowed, the bank collapsed and um, <laughs> it, it became a national scandal. Um, so what happens is that the FDIC actually insures. So if you're a depositor, you have a bank account with an institution and the bank folds, then you get your money back from FDIC. This was tested from some of the big institutions institutional investors back in 2008 because some of the big banks crashed and there's a limit or a cap on FDIC and some of those people actually got paid by FDIC more or higher than they than the cutoff amount and some people obviously if you don't have a lot of money you're screwed by these systems um it's not about you, it's about them and making money, and it's not about the rest of us. When I started talking about this, I had no idea that this podcast would be so long, so I've split this into two parts, and you can get part two tomorrow.